Hello everyone and welcome back to our conference here. Um, my name is Stevie Lewis and I'm a board member of the IIPDW, the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. And I am delighted to have the opportunity to be showing you um, this video on how to safely taper and withdraw from antidepressants. It was made by the IIPDW and it was funded by a grant from Open Excellence and it was edited by a company called Mindwick. And you are going to see a conversation between me and Dr. Mark Horowitz, who you saw speaking earlier, um, on what we know now about antidepressants and how to taper and withdraw. And it feels important uh, for me to say at this point what a huge debt we owe to Mark for all the wor work that he does on the research and what he has had um, published on this topic of hyperbolic tapering, which is what we're going to cover in the video. So why is this video important? And I feel the answer to that is when you look at uh, research on paper, uh, patients' experiences of trying to come off antidepressants, and I've read a lot of research and I've been involved in research on this subject, the key thing that jumps out at you is this discrepancy, this huge gap between um, what prescribers believe about withdrawal and what patients actually find happens to them. And I imagine that there are quite a few out there nodding as I say this. And that situation exists no matter where in the Western world that these drugs are prescribed. It's across the board internationally. And what is so infuriating about this is that um, whereas uh, back when I was first given an antidepressant, which I don't think I actually mentioned in the video when that was, but it was December 1996, right at the height of the defeat depression campaign in the UK that Joanna was talking about. Um, this information didn't exist then, but it does now. There is evidence-based research in prestigious scientific journals on how to withdraw. There are online peer support groups and websites full of information on how to do it. And even as we mentioned in the video, the Royal College of Psychiatry has published guidelines on how to do so. But here in the UK, the Royal College of Psychiatry and the Royal College of GPs, the bodies overseeing these professions still have not made any effort to train their people. And I believe the situation is the same internationally. There is no excuse now for any prescriber anywhere in the world to say they don't know what the latest evidence is on antidepressants. So I believe this video is one of the most important resources that you can find at the moment on how to withdraw safely. Uh, but then I do confess that I'm a tad biased. Um, but it's out there. It's in the public domain. It's on our website. Um, it's available subtitled in Norwegian, Italian, Dutch and Swedish. And we're looking to um, increase that. If you wish to use it as a training resource, please do so. But if you do decide to use it, please also think about donating to the IIPDW because that will help us to expand the reach of the video and expand the reach of our work. I think, Lucy, it's time to show the video. Thank you very much.
training video is presented by the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. The Institute supports the human right to informed choice with regard to psychiatric drugs. Our goals include the development of research and practice-based knowledge that will facilitate safe reduction and withdrawal from psychiatric drugs. In line with that, the subject of the video you're watching is how to withdraw safely from antidepressants. My name is Stevie Lewis. I'm a campaigner who for the past three years has been bringing to the attention of the public, UK governments and the NHS, the potential for patients to become physically dependent on SSRI antidepressants. And importantly, how to recognise and support people in antidepressant withdrawal. Our aim for today is to explain to doctors and members of the public how withdrawal presents itself and how to help people withdraw safely so they don't have to go through the unpleasant and protracted withdrawal process that I had to. To set the scene for this, I'm going to give you some background on my own experience and then I'm going to be talking to an expert in antidepressant withdrawal and safe tapering, Dr. Mark Horowitz. We're planning to cover the process of how to identify withdrawal, how to safely taper and how to stop antidepressants, which we hope will be educational for doctors and members of the public alike. Mark Horowitz is a clinical research fellow in psychiatry at UCL and the NHS. He has a PhD in the neurobiology of antidepressants from the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London. He has published papers on safe tapering in the Lancet Psychiatry and authored the Royal College of Psychiatry Guidance on Stopping Antidepressants. Hello and welcome, Mark. Hi, Stevie. I'm very happy to be here. Let's start by giving some background on my experience with antidepressants. I took an SSRI, um, Siroxat or Paroxetine, which is its generic name, for 17 years. And I didn't choose to take it for that long. I took it willingly for about three years in all. And the rest I spent trying to stop. I went to the doctor originally with intermittent insomnia, which happened when I went away on business. And it had happened to me once in the past when I first went to university. And I remembered that the very occasional Mogadon, which is a benzo benzodiazepine, had solved the problem nicely. So that's what I went along for. My GP at the time asked me some additional questions. I told him about the unexplained levels of low anxiety I had once a month. And he then shocked me, really, by telling me that I was on the edge of a clinical depression that I had a chemical balance in my brain and that my brain wasn't producing enough serotonin and that I needed to take this antidepressant Siroxat brand name, as I mentioned, for paroxetine in the United Kingdom. I needed to take a tablet daily to correct this imbalance. Now, I already knew about the potential for addiction with the benzodiazepines. Um, that class of drugs includes Valium or Xanax, Ativan. Um, and I asked him at the time if this could happen with Siroxat, and he assured me this was a new class of drugs and that I couldn't become addicted to it. And looking back, the word withdrawal didn't feature in that or any subsequent dialogues with him. So I took Siroxat for about six months and then um, I decided to stop because I felt fine. And I had about three weeks of dizziness and nausea and it was bad enough that I went to see the doctor with the problem and he suggested I had labyrinthitis. I then had about a nine month break uh, during which I didn't take anything, but I had some um, difficult life events. Uh, my mother died. I had three miscarriages. And so um, I ended up with similar symptoms of anxiety and insomnia. And I went back to the doctor and these symptoms were again attributed to my chemical imbalance. So back on Siroxat for about a year and um, I stopped again because I felt perfectly well. And this time I noticed within about 36 to 48 hours, I was feeling quite anxious. I couldn't sleep. I had no appetite and I couldn't stop crying. Um, the doctor this time said that I had relapsed 
Uh, my original symptoms were worse. I had a general anxiety disorder. And this was a diagnosis I just couldn't argue with because I never experienced symptoms like this ever in my life before. So back on Siroxat for another just under two years, I think. And I stopped again. Um, I wanted to see if my brain chemicals were now balanced. Um, but I found again, the symptoms were even worse. And I noticed that there seemed to be a pattern to my symptoms arriving and their resolution. They seem to be predictable. There seemed to be a time element to this. 36 to 48 hours after stopping the drug, I became more ill than I could ever remember being. And after about the same period of time, when I reintroduced, reintroduced the drug, I felt perfectly well again. And this made me wonder, is this really me? Am I, am I really this ill? Or possibly, is it the drug? And this prompted me to look on the internet. Uh, this was a time when there were only really two SSRIs being prescribed. So Siroxat, Paroxetine or Prozac. It didn't take much searching to find that there were a couple of main groups of people out there, one in the US and one in this country, who were all struggling to come off Siroxat or Paxil, as it's called in the US. And they had exactly the same symptoms as me. And they were claiming that they were addicted to or as we now know more accurately, physically dependent on this drug and that the symptoms I was experiencing were the same as they were describing and they were calling it pure withdrawal. And I learned around the same time that this diagnosis of chemical imbalance that I'd been given had no basis in science whatsoever. So this left me with future years of continually trying to withdraw and with virtually no support as withdrawal was not really acknowledged as existing. I had moved to Wales, so I had a new GP and she did her best to help me. Uh, when I asked for help, she supplied me with the liquid so that I could uh, reduce more slowly. She helped me with supplying syringes. But it's fair to say that no matter what I did, how many attempts I made, each time um, the withdrawal symptoms got worse and worse and they got worse the lower that I went of, of, on the dose. This was what I experienced. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this film, our intention is that it helps to educate doctors and inform members of the public so that people in a similar position to me won't struggle and suffer like I had to, because I didn't know what to do properly to taper. And the information available to help me was either limited or inaccurate. Mark is now going to take us through how the science that is available to us now can explain and demonstrate my experience. So Mark, tell us, when I was seeing my doctor, what would they have been told at that time about antidepressant withdrawal? So first, Stevie, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear what you've been through. Uh, sadly, it's it's an, an all too common story, um, and, and I think it, it's very representative of what uh, was happening uh, years ago, and probably to some degree is still happening today. Um, and so, the first thing is uh, many GPs at that time and still today have been taught to call the symptoms that occur when you stop an antidepressant discontinuation symptoms, not withdrawal symptoms. And this was an attempt by drug companies to try to distinguish their drugs from drugs you've mentioned, the benzodiazepines that had been associated with withdrawal symptoms. They didn't want their market to be affected in the same way as it had been for benzodiazepines by this negative association with withdrawal symptoms. And so they invented a euphemism, discontinuation symptoms, which sounds much more benign and less threatening than withdrawal symptoms. The description that, that GPs were, were taught was that these discontinuation symptoms were mild and they were brief or self-limiting, often for a week or two. And that was what was in the NICE guidelines, the authoritative guidelines in England and in guidelines around the world, including in America. And really the origin of this description was a consensus panel 
put together by a drug company in which the phrase brief and mild was repeated, distributed in numerous academic papers until it became uh, almost a, a pharmaceutical meme, uh, a line that was repeated again and again in papers and that found its way out into authoritative guidance. So uh, when you went to see your GP, they would have expected mild and brief symptoms coming off an antidepressant, not the kind of disastrous, severe symptoms that you presented with. So what did doctors then know about how to stop an antidepressant? Along with the idea that discontinuation symptoms were mild and brief, in order to avoid them, not a lot of effort was needed. And so the advice given was people can stop antidepressants over two or four weeks. And in the NICE guidance for years, it's said that patients can, can stop their antidepressants over four weeks. The advice to stop over four weeks was a consensus position of a few doctors at the time and not based on any evidence. And unfortunately, this advice has been propagated through medical school, through lectures, through the GP learning system. And that's what is accepted as, as the basic practice at the moment. So can you describe to us then what are the withdrawal symptoms that one gets from an antidepressant? The withdrawal symptoms you can get from coming, either coming down on an antidepressant or stopping it are a myriad. They can manifest in both physical and psychological symptoms. And that's because the, the neurotransmitters affected by antidepressants, serotonin and other neurotransmitters, uh, affect many different bodily systems. Um, and therefore they have very wide ranging effects. So for example, there are physical symptoms like dizziness, headache, nausea, vivid dreams. There are quite distinctive sensory symptoms. People describe electric shocks in their head or even in their limbs sometimes. There are effects on the gut, like nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. There are a number of effects on muscles, so people can get tremors, troubles with coordination, muscle pain, and spasms. One particularly concerning effect of antidepressant withdrawal is akathisia, uh, better known as an adverse effect of antipsychotics but it can occur in people coming off antidepressants. Um, I've seen it and it, is, it, is, it can be horrible. It's described by people as their nervous system being on fire. It can lead people to, be, to, to feel incredibly uncomfortable in their own skin, leading to pacing and in some cases to suicide because the sensation is so unbearable. So this is probably the worst possible consequence of withdrawal. It's also been found in, in quite large studies that there is an increase in suicide attempts in the weeks after stopping an antidepressant. So, so the effect um, of withdrawal can be very profound on a person, um, manifesting, yes, as I've said, both in physical and psychological symptoms. In fact, there are, there are lists that, that, that list 80 or more possible symptoms. So really almost every system in the body can be affected by withdrawal. So why do people get withdrawal symptoms? Right. So um, antidepressants work by modifying the levels of chemicals in our brain. So many of them act on serotonin, some act on noradrenaline, others act on dopamine. Uh, we, we now know that there's no evidence for lowered levels of these neurotransmitters in people with anxiety or depression. So these antidepressants are therefore causing a change in the normal uh, chemistry of the brain. And the brain adapts to the presence of these drugs to these changes because of a principle known as homeostasis. So when we are, when we're at, when we're in a cold environment, our body warms up to maintain our temperature. The same kind of homeostatic principle is applied to a neurotransmitter like serotonin. So when it's increased, the brain and the body becomes less sensitive to serotonin. Uh, leading to a down regulation of serotonin receptors. And that means that when the antidepressant is reduced in dose or taken away, uh, that the level of chemicals that the brain has become used to is now lowered 
and the brain experiences this as a deficit of serotonin. And this is what causes withdrawal symptoms. And the withdrawal symptoms probably last as long as it takes the brain to go back to its normal level of sensitivity. So it's, 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 it's um, level of sensitivity before the antidepressant was started. Um, this also helps to explain why withdrawal symptoms can last so long. People often say, well, the drug is out of the body, so how could you possibly have withdrawal symptoms? Yeah. And this is a misunderstanding of what's causing withdrawal. Withdrawal is caused by a difference between what the brain expects in terms of levels of, of, of neurochemicals and what's actually provided. And it's the time taken for the brain to get used to the lower levels that, that explains why withdrawal symptoms can last so long. And if, that's, if, if your system takes months or years to get back to normal, then that's the period of time that someone will experience withdrawal symptoms. And now that we understand that, it makes a lot more sense why people can have such long lasting symptoms. And, and then um, it also helps to explain why there's so many myriad varied symptoms of withdrawal. We have serotonin receptors in the gut, for example, and that's why people will have uh, gastrointestinal symptoms. We have serotonin receptors all throughout um, uh, the nervous system, muscles, and so all of these systems can be affected by withdrawal. Yeah, you can you can see, can't you, how what you're describing there is 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 such a chaotic range of symptoms, which um, I experienced firsthand, and how this mu th these must baffle GPs. Um, I, I mean, for example, I went, I visited my GP for problems with palpitations, insomnia, I saw specialists for gut problems, I developed a movement disorder, and what you're describing there is, is um, all these can be traced back to how serotonin affects the body and mind. Um, and you, you can also tell that doctors think that they are being um, uh, presented with mental health sy sy symptoms as opposed to what is really happening, um, physical reactions to the absence of the drug. And this is so important for doctors to understand. This is, this is a physical problem. And I wish my GP had known that. And um, it's good to hear that hopefully things are changing now and this aspect of withdrawal is going to be recognized. So I exactly, I, I think GPs are, are baffled by these presentations because there is such a wide range of symptoms and they're also very um, uh, taught to be very closely vigilant of a relapse. So they're always thinking in their mind, is this person relapsing with anxiety and depression? And that causes them to focus on the psychological manifestations of withdrawal rather than the physical symptoms. I think that leads to a lot of the trouble that we will hopefully talk about. Well, yes. Yeah. So can withdrawal symptoms be mistaken by uh, a prescriber for a return of the underlying condition? So, so I think the answer is absolutely. And I think it happens very common of the, the tens of thousands of people um, on uh, peer led websites who, who are uh, getting advice on how to come off of antidepressants safely. Most of them say that they're there because they had withdrawal symptoms that were misdiagnosed as a return of their condition by their GP or psychiatrist. So it, it must be a widespread phenomenon. And it's very easy to understand why that might be, because we know that withdrawal symptoms include anxiety, depressed mood, and poor sleep, which, which can look a lot like a return of the underlying condition. We know that these mood symptoms can be withdrawal symptoms because even people with no underlying mental health condition experience these symptoms when they reduce or stop an antidepressant. So for example, people who are prescribed an antidepressant for pain or the menopause, when they reduce their antidepressant, they can experience these symptoms. So it's not just people that have an underlying condition. And that's how we're, we can be sure that these are withdrawal symptoms. It's very easy for GPs to make the mistake of thinking this is the underlying condition coming back because a patient walks in the first thing they say is they're anxious they can't sleep um, and, and gps have been taught one that discontinuation symptoms are generally mild and brief so when someone comes into their office saying you know i've got these very severe symptoms they've been here for weeks the first thing they're going to think about is relapse because that doesn't match their description in their minds of discontinuation symptoms being mild and brief. Uh, it's also especially likely to occur if the GP 
doesn't think or know to ask about other symptoms, uh, especially physical symptoms that make withdrawal symptoms more distinctive. So I think foremost in a, in a, in a GP's mind uh, uh, is relapse. You've got to be a, a pretty um, clued up GP to ask about attendant withdrawal symptoms like dizziness, or nausea, or, or muscle problems, something that will help you distinguish it from uh, an underlying condition coming back. I think that's why it happens so, so commonly that these withdrawal symptoms are mistaken for a return of an underlying condition. Then this is really, really important for people, um, anybody who is watching us now, Mark, how can withdrawal symptoms be distinguished from relapse? I think there are a few clues that can help um, both patients and doctors distinguish withdrawal symptoms from relapse, um, some of which we, we've touched on. So one is quicker onset for withdrawal symptoms. So people experience withdrawal symptoms often days after reducing or stopping their medication. In some of the shorter acting drugs like paroxetine, it can actually happen within, a, within hours of missing a dose. Um, that is That is not typical for a return of an underlying condition, which can take weeks or months after stopping a medication. There's a bit of a proviso to this in that long acting drugs like fluoxetine or Prozac can have withdrawal symptoms that are themselves delayed by days or weeks. And sometimes you hear of patients that do experience withdrawal symptoms, even in shorter acting drugs that are delayed longer. So I think people need to have a high index of suspicion for withdrawal symptoms, but one clue is happening soon after reducing dose. Probably the most helpful um, aspect to look for is symptoms other than psychological symptoms that are present along with them. So if someone comes in with anxiety and trouble sleeping, it's worth asking about other symptoms like dizziness, like nausea, like electric shock sensations that are clearly not symptoms of an underlying anxious or depressive disorder and help to distinguish it as a withdrawal syndrome. I think it's also worth saying that if a person has psychological symptoms that are very different from their underlying condition, that's another clue that's probably withdrawal. So if someone went on a medication because they had low mood and they were sleeping all the time, and now a few days after stopping their medication, they can't sleep and are having panic attacks, completely different symptoms from their underlying condition, it's much more likely that they've developed withdrawal symptoms rather than happening to coincidentally develop a new mental health condition just at the moment they've stopped a medication. Possible, but very unlikely, much more plausible that they've got symptoms related to the change in the drug. Um, so I think it's good for doctors to understand what were the original symptoms and use that to distinguish them from whatever is happening when people come in with new symptoms after stopping their drug. Another way to help distinguish, more helpful in retrospect, I think you've gone through something similar, that when you restart the drug, the symptoms go away reasonably quickly if you restart it soon after the symptoms come on. So if you've been off the drug for a couple of weeks, you go back on it, often people will experience an improvement in their symptoms over a few days. It's a little bit less likely to have as quick an effect if you wait months afterwards, but even then it can improve symptoms. And that is a sign probably that it's withdrawal symptoms if they, are, if they resolve fairly quickly after restarting a medication. Another thing for people who are making small reductions, they can often see a wave pattern of withdrawal symptoms. Uh, symptoms come on a few days after stopping, they get worse, they reach a peak, they start to improve and they resolve. And that pattern of worsening and, and getting better is very typical of withdrawal and different from return of, a, of an underlying condition which can stick around for a lot longer. I think the last thing to say is what is not useful. And that is, I think, a, a historical idea that if someone has symptoms that are very severe or that are lasting a long time, then that must be a return of their underlying condition. Now that we understand that withdrawal symptoms can be severe and can be long lasting, that is no longer a very helpful um, uh, characteristic to help distinguish withdrawal from relapse. That leads us on really very neatly to our next question. What has happened recently with our understanding of how hard it is to stop antidepressants? 
Right. So there has been really a, a burgeoning interest in this topic over the last few years, and we, we've learned a lot of things about it. I mean, in, in reality, the first cases of people having trouble stopping antidepressants because of withdrawal symptoms uh, were first reported in the in the early 1990s. So it's really been known now for 30 years. But the first systematic review of this topic was only done uh, a couple of years ago uh, by, by Davies and Reed. And what this review looked at, it was all the existing studies about uh, withdrawal symptoms. And, and its findings were, were quite startling to the field. And what they, what they showed essentially was withdrawal is more common, more severe and more long lasting than official guidance had set up until that point. They, they found that withdrawal symptoms occur in about half of people, no matter what sort of study you're looking at, and that in, in maybe up to a half of, of patients to experience withdrawal, these symptoms are severe, and they often last longer than a week or two with groups of some patients experiencing symptoms that go for months or even years. Um, these, these findings were reflected in a report put out by Public Health England, the major public health body finding very, very similar um, findings. This also led to wider spread recognition by the Royal College of Psychiatrists in England and also NICE, the producer of guidelines for, for doctors in England, who both updated their guidance to recognise, first of all, that withdrawal symptoms is the scientifically correct term for what was previously called discontinuation symptoms, which is a helpful step to, to help understand what is going on, and also that people can experience withdrawal symptoms that are both severe and long-lasting. Um, and and, and uh, to its credit, the Royal College of Psychiatrists put out a position statement that advises doctors that they should be informing patient, patients of the possibility of both severe and long-lasting withdrawal symptoms when they stop an antidepressant at the time they're considering starting it. So this should be part of informed consent that a patient may, may decide they want to use an antidepressant, but they should be aware of the difficulty that some people have when they're trying to stop it. And so I think there is, is much uh, more widespread recognition of, of the trouble people have when stopping these drugs now. The, the Davies Reed uh, research was a game changer, really. I mean, when I think back, I always had the impression that my doctor thought that I was an anomaly. Um, I remember specifically her saying to me, I have lots of people on Siroxat and they're fine. Um, and she seemed mystified by what was happening to me. And I guess that um, she and uh, most other prescribers just don't see withdrawal because they're not expecting to. And through Davies and Reed, we now know that it is actually more likely than not that you will have some form of withdrawal. Yes, I think that's exactly right. I think what was what was one of the most startling findings was how common withdrawal is. And I think you, you've said it pr probably correctly about GPs. It's very hard to see something that you haven't been trained to see. Mm. And so I think a lot of GPs are seeing a lot of relapse or a lot of return of people's underlying condition because they've been trained to see that rather than to see withdrawal. Yeah, yeah. So where are we now with the understanding of how to stop antidepressants? So, so along with the interest in withdrawal, there's also been uh, increasing interest in what is the safest way to stop antidepressants. And I think over the last few years, we've developed a, a slightly more sophisticated understanding of how to stop antidepressants safely. And this has been based on some studies that have been conducted, a better understanding of the pharmacology, the way these drugs work, but mostly a lot of clinical experience especially a lot of patient-led experience from the sort of peer support groups that, that you received advice from that have now proliferated around the internet with people like Adele Framer at Surviving Antidepressants really contributing to greater understanding of how to come off these drugs more safely. I think it's very well summarised in the guidance put forward by the Royal College of Psychiatry on how to come off antidepressants. And they, they make some uh, general comments to start with. So this is guidance that was published um, at the end of 2020. And they recommend, first of all, that patients who have been on antidepressants for more than a few weeks uh, taper off over months or longer, meaning that some people will take years. 
They suggest going down to very small doses for some patients, perhaps less than a milligram before stopping. And they recommend going down in smaller and smaller size reductions as you get to lower doses. And they also advise that people should go down at a rate that the, the patient can tolerate and so that the rate should be titrated to what the person can, can, can handle. And um, a little bit of work that we did uh, helped to explain where this guidance came from. It helped to inform the Royal College of Psychiatry guidelines. So a couple of years ago, we looked at the way that the, the way that antidepressants act on the brain. And this is a graph of a common antidepressant, citalopram, the way it affects the brain, in this case showing its effect on the serotonin transporter, the major target of these drugs in the brain. And what you can see is the relationship between dose of an antidepressant on the bottom axis and the effect on the brain is not a straight line, but it's this curve, what the shape we, we call a hyperbola. And that tells us something about what happens when you reduce your dose. So a lot of doctors intuitively think that going down by even amounts of dose makes sense. So for example, if someone's on 20 milligrams of citalopram, it seems perfectly reasonable to go down to 15, 10, five, and then zero milligrams. But what you can see from this graph is the first reduction from 20 milligrams to 15 milligrams causes this very small decrease in effect on the brain. The reduction from 15 to 10 causes a slightly larger decrease in effect. Going from 10 to five will cause a slightly larger effect on the brain. But going down from five to zero will cause this incredibly large change in effect on the brain. And this very much matches what patients report, that as they get down to lower doses, uh, actually, as Stevie mentioned, the, the withdrawal symptoms get worse. And it's probably because there's larger changes happening to, to, the, to the equilibrium of the brain. These bigger changes are causing bigger disruptions. And so from this, we guess that it makes more sense to reduce antidepressants in such a way that it reduces the effect on the brain by even amounts rather than even amounts of dose. And so to produce even amounts of reduction of effect on the brain, in this case, 20 percentage points, requires this rather peculiar pattern of dose reduction, a hyperbolic pattern of dose reduction, because it matches the curve, where each reduction becomes smaller and smaller. So at first you can reduce by 10 or 15 milligrams, then the next step reducing by two and a half milligrams, then by a milligram and a half. And the final dose before completely stopping is a very small dose, in this case, 0.8 milligrams, so that the reduction in effect on the brain is not much larger than the effect of those previous dose reductions. And, and it's from that that the, the guidance on how to come off antidepressants safely has been derived. And that's why the, the guidance recommends going down by smaller and smaller amounts, down to very low doses before stopping. And in particular, you, you can approximate these sort of reductions by making proportional dose reductions, which means, for example, reducing dose by 10% or 20% of the most recent dose you've been on each month. So, for example, if you're making reductions of 10% of a month, the reductions will become smaller and smaller because the total dose you're on gets smaller and smaller. And this guidance is now uh, not just in the Royal College of Psychiatry guidance, but also in the in, in NICE guidance that advises all, all doctors in England. There's also a little bit of evidence that slower tapering is more likely to produce better outcomes. So in a, in a paper that we reviewed uh, done in Japan, it shows that people who come off antidepressants over nine months uh, have a lot less trouble with withdrawal than people who come off uh, very quickly. And in fact, in that study, people came off between over, over lengths of time between one month and four years. Um, and in that way, most of them were able to, to avoid withdrawal symptoms. So 
uh, we're understanding that the slower that you go, the less likely you are to have unpleasant withdrawal symptoms. Um, and we've, there's also been some studies using tapering strips, which are small doses of antidepressants that allow you to make this kind of hyperbolic dose reductions. And in a, a number of studies um, put out about tapering strips, it's shown that people that were not able to come off their antidepressants by coming down more quickly uh, were able to come off them when they use these smaller doses and went down to very small final doses before stopping. And we now know that, that some people may take years to come off their drugs safely. And this is simply because this is the time it takes for these people's brains to readjust themselves to lower levels of the drug. I might give a couple of examples um, because that's, that makes it a little bit easier to make sense of what's happening. Here is an example given in the Royal College of Psychiatry guidance that I would consider a fairly rapid reduction. And this is an example of citalopram um, and it's re suggesting reductions made by 50% every two to four weeks. So someone who's starting on 40 milligrams of citalopram would halve their dose to 20 if there was no significant symptoms or no, no very unpleasant withdrawal symptoms, they would then go to 10 milligrams after two or four weeks and then halve again. And to achieve this kind of small dose, they would need to split a tablet in half. If things were, if withdrawal symptoms were tolerable, they would go for another step down to 2.5 milligrams. By the time you're down to these sort of small doses, tablets will not be small enough to be able to make up these small doses. And so you can either use liquids, which are available in many countries or other options like tapering strips or compounding pharmacies, which make up small doses. Keep on halving the dose until you got down to that very small dose so that this final reduction to zero won't cause a bigger change in effect on the brain as these previous steps. And if, if things went well with no withdrawal symptoms, you, you would then stop the medication. Of course, if things didn't go so well, if you had significant withdrawal symptoms, then you want to slow down this reduction and introduce intermediate steps. So you would make, rather than 50% reductions, you might make 25% dose reductions. And if that caused too many withdrawal symptoms, you would go down even slower, down to 10% every two to four weeks. And if that caused too significant withdrawal symptoms, you go down, you go down even slower. An example of an even slower reduction for a drug that's particularly hard to come off Paroxetine, which Stevie knows all too well, is also given as an example in the Royal College of Psychiatry Guidance. So this, this gives an example of reducing by 10% of the most recent dose every two to four weeks. So in this case, starting on 40 milligrams of paroxetine, the first reduction you'd make is 10% of 40 milligrams, which is four milligrams down to 36 milligrams. Straight away here, there's gonna be difficulty making up this exact dose using widely available tablets, which generally come as 10, 20, or 40 milligrams. And so you're going to need to either make up the entire dose with a liquid preparation, which is generally widely available, or a combination of tablets and liquids. Further dose reductions would then be made by reducing by 10% of that dose. So 10% of 36 milligrams is 3.6 milligrams. So now you're down to 32.4, then 10% of that dose. And you, can, and you can start to see that because these doses are not um, similar to those easily available as tablets, people will need to be either using liquids, uh, compounding chemists or, or, or tapering strips in order to make these small reductions. You can see the dose gets smaller and smaller. And as you get down to lower doses, the size of the reductions become smaller and smaller. And in fact, this is an abbreviated version of it. In this little box here, there are almost 30 further steps as you go down very slowly, 10% a month, down to this very small final dose before stopping. And again, going down to this small dose of this final step down is, doesn't cause more disruption than the, than the doses beforehand. And so because each of these steps might take a, a month, going through this process can take several years. And I've certainly seen people who have taken three, four, five or longer years to come off paroxetine, which is particularly known for its severe withdrawal effects. In fact, it's worth saying some people can and can't come off even this quickly and will need to come off at half this rate or, or less. And so some people will have severe withdrawal effects from, from minor reductions 
and we'll need to find a, a rate slow enough for them to be able to tolerate it. That's a very worthwhile guidance to look at. What you've been through, Mark, there is, well, it's a brilliant example of the science explaining my experience of trying and so frequently failing to withdraw. Um, <clears throat> everyone believes that the lower you go, uh, the easier it will be. And intuitively, you can see why. Um, but you've shown that the absolute opposite is true. Um, it sounds like five milligrams is a really small dose and that you should be able to stop with no problems. But in actual fact, uh, that really is not the case. And how I got into a cycle of getting down around that, having terrible problems and thinking I've just not done it fast, uh, slowly enough and going back up. And this became a, um, an unpleasant um, cycle over, over many years. Another thing to mention is that although all efforts should be made to make the process as tolerable as possible for the patient in all the ways just described, going slowly, uh, titrating the re reduction rate to the pace that a patient can tolerate, it is still likely the process will not be without some bumps, at least for some patients. And so for this reason, it's also very helpful to have support and understanding throughout the process from people around them. For some people, the support might be from a professional counsellor, ideally one that is well aware of withdrawal, but for everybody it helps to have family and friends informed about the process, uh, especially because some people will be used to seeing symptoms as a reason to go back on medication. And so educating family and friends about the process of slowly stopping about withdrawal symptoms can help to put everybody on the same page so everyone's heading in the same direction. Uh, this also applies to other nurses, doctors involved in the person's medical care because there is such a, a poor understanding of withdrawal from antidepressants generally. It can lead to all sorts of misinterpretations from people around them. So it's good to keep all relevant medical staff informed. Um, and, and because it can be a difficult time for people, having support, having understanding from people around them can make a big difference. There's also a range of coping skills that might be useful for someone going through unpleasant withdrawal symptoms, including distraction, mindfulness, light exercise, amongst others, very much depending on what people are used to using to get through difficult times. One thing that can be very helpful is simply to remind people that what they're experiencing is likely to be withdrawal symptoms, that they're transitory, that they will resolve. Uh, people can, can lose perspective sometimes when in the midst of withdrawal symptoms. And there are lots of good resources around for further coping techniques in places like the Withdrawal Project online and, and the guidance for psychological therapists also available online, uh, put together by different psychotherapy organizations led by Anne Guy. And another thing that might be useful is for people to plan um, early on to have uh, their professional and social duties arranged as much as possible around withdrawal uh, to the extent that that is, that is able to be achieved. So are there any other tips or tricks that you can give to people to help them avoid um, the difficulties I had? Right, so I, think, I think you made probably the, the main point there, which is, Counterintuitively, as you get to lower doses, you need to slow down your tapering because of the effects of very small doses, um, which lots of people have learned the hard way, and, and we now understand what the what the neuroscience is underlying that. I think another common um, uh, error that people make is uh, they work out that going down too quickly um, causes severe withdrawal effects, and so they think that they will slow it, slow the process down by taking drugs every second day or every third day, um, which, which makes, again, intuitive sense. You want, you're thinking you're taking less of the drug. But the problem with most antidepressants is they have a half-life of about one day. A half-life is the time taken for the body to excrete half the drug. Um, and so if a drug has a half-life of 24 hours, that means your body will get rid of it uh, we'll get rid of half of it every 24 hours. If you take such a drug every second day, your blood levels will go down to a quarter of what they normally are. 
After one day, it's down to a half. After two days, it's down to a quarter. After three days, it's down to one eighth. And that, that very large decrease in the levels in your body can cause severe withdrawal effects. So I think a lot of GPs um, with well-meaning intentions give the advice to take drugs every second or third day in order to get down to lower doses. I think that advice often backfires and causes severe withdrawal symptoms. And it's better to take a smaller dose each day and that, that necessitates using something like a liquid version of the drug or making up smaller tablets with a compounding pharmacy or with tapering strips. Um, and I think even though it's more trouble, it's much better for the patient. Um, and I think that's worth saying that for safe tapering of most people, they can't do it with, with currently available tablets because the doses are simply too large and most people will need access to some form of the drug that allows smaller doses and that means GPs prescribing things like liquids or, or other smaller tablet forms. Um, I think another point to make is people assume that it's very easy to come off fluoxetine, which has a longer half-life than other drugs. It might be easier, but fluoxetine can be a tricky drug because withdrawal symptoms are delayed after reducing or stopping the drug, and that can make it harder for people to spot. Uh, drugs with a short half-life of paroxetine are very easy to spot because people feel terrible a day or two afterwards. Whereas if you're if it's six or eight weeks down the track, people often don't put it together in their head. So I don't think um, fluoxetine has been thought of as being self-tapering because it goes out of your body over a few weeks. But because we know that some people will take months or years to come off these drugs safely, it's not it's not self-tapering enough to just stop it abruptly. And it should also be tapered in much the same way as other drugs. Uh, and I think the last point to make is the process of switching from one antidepressant to another is not as simple as it's sometimes presented because you are in effect withdrawing from one drug in order to get onto the other drug. And so you have the issues with the, 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 the adverse or side effects of the new drug, but you also have the problem of withdrawing from the first drug. So I think the process of switching is much more um, complicated than people often think it is. In my own research and based on the many people in the same situation as me that I've spoken to, what's going to be so vital about all of this is um, patients actually being believed um, when they go into their doctors and a discussion can be had about the fact that they could really be in withdrawal, that this range of symptoms is withdrawal, that doctors will acknowledge that, that they will believe it, and therefore their, their families and friends will be believe, believe in it too, because it is such a wide range of symptoms. And you touched upon earlier how important it is that there is this new narrative. We're looking for a new narrative in the doctor's surgery, that at the time of first prescribing, that there is a genuine informed consent um, so that a fully informed patient is made aware right at the start of the risks and benefits of taking these drugs, um, which, of course, could lead people to actually um, decide that they might not start on the path of taking an antidepressant, um, that they might try exercise, social prescribing, um, even the good old wait and see approach, because we've learned that um, sadness can pass feelings of sadness, um, these feelings of emotional distress will pass with time. So, you know, looking back, I wonder if I'd known all of this, whether I would have taken um, an antidepressant in the first place. But to wrap up, what would you tell a doctor or a patient now? What are the take home messages so that a person doesn't end up like I did, stuck on an antidepressant for years and struggling with appalling withdrawal? The main take home messages are, one, we shouldn't mistake withdrawal for relapse. So feeling anxious or depressed when reducing or stopping antidepressants is not necessarily a sign of relapse. These symptoms are very common in withdrawal and we should bear that in mind. Tapering antidepressants over much longer periods than we're used to tapering them over, for example, months or sometimes years for people that are on long-term medications is more likely to be successful than quicker tapering. Number three, when we make reductions, it should be by smaller and smaller amounts. As the total dose gets lower, 
called proportion or hyperbolic tapering because of the way drugs act on the brain. Number four, some patients will need to go down to very small doses before stopping, for example, a fraction of a milligram for some patients with some antidepressants. Number five, in order to make the small reductions of antidepressant needed, patients will need access to either liquid versions of the drug or another way to make up small doses, for example, tapering strips. Number six, very importantly, the rate of tapering should be modified or titrated based on the patient's ability to tolerate the reductions, particularly regarding withdrawal symptoms. And they should be able to go at their own pace. Number seven, with the exception of fluoxetine, the short half-life of most antidepressants means that every other day dosing risks withdrawal symptoms. And it's better to take the same small dose every day. Number eight, there is increasing sources of um, good uh, guidance, for example, from the Royal College of Psychiatrists, now from NICE. There's guidance in the Maudsley Prescribing Guidelines and the IIPDW website is full of useful uh, sources of information. And number nine, although a gradual individualized taper is the best way to minimize distress caused by stopping antidepressants, the people certainly benefit from the support and understanding of their loved ones around them and for well-informed and from well-informed professionals. Thank you very much, Mark. You've been through um, a lot of information there, which I think is going to be really valuable. And that detailed explanation of how the science demonstrates what patients experience is vital to help make sense of what can seem like this wide range of chaotic symptoms, which are in truth a physical response to the absence of the drug, not a growing or enduring mental health problem. And just as you did there, I'm going to re-emphasize that although the science may be constant, human beings are individual and unique, and each person will have a different response to an antidepressant and to its reduction. And it's vital that everyone is enabled and free to go at their own pace. So we hope that this information that we've passed on today has been helpful in providing more of an insight into the difficulties that some people may have when coming off antidepressants and how to be able to recognize those difficulties when you might not have seen them in the past and how to support other people through this process. So this film was made on behalf of the International Institute for Psychiatric Drug Withdrawal. We are a not-for-profit not organization uh, we rely on your donations to help us keep our organization going, including our website. So if you found this video useful, please consider supporting our work. We are at iipdw.org. And by donating, you'll be helping to add to the growing call for an informed global response to the issues of psychiatric drug withdrawal. Thank you and goodbye. Hello again. I very, very much hope that each of you found something that was of value in that video. Um, I imagine that for any of you actually taking an antidepressant, it has probably thrown up um, a load more questions. But nonetheless, I hope that it has given you some insight as to what you might do and how you might go about your um, reduction journey in a way that isn't as painful as it might become. Um, we 
if you find that you would like to use that video, and I was asked particularly in the, in the Q&A from someone um, about having it in their particular language, please, if you want it translated into your language, we do have the ability to do that, to subtitle it. Um, but we need help from someone in the native country to proofread it, to make sure that it's accurate. We cannot have something going out that's inaccurate before it's put online. So if you would like to uh, have it in your language and you're prepared to help with that, or you know someone who will help with that, um, please contact us at the IIPDW and the detail for our email or the website will keep cropping up in the chat. I, uh, I, I'm sure that Lucy will keep putting it up there for you. Um, at the end of the main part of today's conference um, at 6.45, we are inviting everyone to join us for a Zoom discussion separate from this webinar. And um, there will be um, the, um, the link for that will come up in the chat. Um, and we're going to be asking for input from you, of course. And in the second half of that, um, you will have the opportunity to give us any feedback if you'd like to on on the film, um, uh, anything that you want to say to us, any feedback or observations, which we would love to hear. Uh, right now, we're going to have a 15 minute break. Um, and then um, we will be welcoming Adele Framer, Sarah Tilly and Karen Prelitz Hoffman. And they're going to be talking about the role of peer support in healthcare, peer support, which is so helpful to so many people, particularly on their withdrawal journey. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. Thank you again and see you. I think it's going to be 5.30, isn't it? <laughs>